We are now picking up with the story of Clabe Jones after the battles of Leatherwood and Salt Wells. The Civil War was still far from over. The Appalachian Mountains were still ringing with the sounds of gunshots, and the mountains were filled with the smoke of the military campfires. Brother was still fighting against brother, and the war still reigned over the communities of the area. First Lieutenant James Clabe Jones still is a scout under the command of Major Benjamin F. Blankenship and the Company A Captain George W. Morgan of the Harlan County Battalion. This would change, however, in this section of the story. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine. Please fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up the time machine to transport us. Please help by clicking the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. Guarding Sick Men at Car Fork Sometime after the small battle at the Salt Wells, Lieutenant Jones and Captain Shade Combs were guarding some incapacitated men at the Stop Gap Hospital Camp located at the mouth of Car Fork. Because almost all of the men there were in their makeshift beds at the infirmary. There were only four guns in the camp to keep the men safe in an emergency. The small field hospital of sick men made a very appealing target to the rebels who wanted to get rid of the Union soldiers from the area. Seizing the tempting opportunity, rebel captain Anne Hayes attacked the encampment with a task force several times larger than the number of men that were present. However, this would not prove to be a very easy undertaking. Surprised by the attack, Reverend Ira Combs, Jones, and two other soldiers were the only men to have guns in the camp. However, these four brave men held off the greater numbers of men as they gave their fellow soldiers time and an opening to escape the area. Seeing that the four men were not going to give up their position very easily and that the men were now gone, Captain Hayes did not see the point in continuing the shootout with the four men and retreated back to their camp. The 14th Kentucky Cavalry On January 13, 1863, the Harlan Battalion was scheduled to be mustered out of service. Jones and his men went to Irvine, Kentucky, where they joined the 14th Kentucky Cavalry. Within a week, the cavalry was ordered to move to Richmond, Virginia. Clabe Jones was declared to be a disabled man and unable to fight. His men got mad about it, and Colonel Lilly kept Jones on and made him a scout and a spy for the cavalry, as he had experience in that field. William Mosley and Font Fuller were sent out with Jones for these tasks. While spying in Perry County at Mason Creek, they captured a man named Cornet. Mosley and Fuller wanted to kill Cornet for revenge for the rebels burning down Mosley's house. Jones felt that an innocent man should not be killed for what others had done, so he hid Cornet in a cabin from the two men to save his life. The two men tried several times to get at the two men in the cabin, and so Jones gave him a gun to defend himself in case they finally broke in. When the next day came, Cornet and Jones were still safe. Thankful that Jones had protected him through the night, Cornet handed over his gun so that the two men headed to Boonesville. They had to stop over in Goose Creek, where there were three women there. Jones gave over his guns to the women to guard Cornet while he slept. They agreed to do this because one of the rebels had killed one of their husbands and the other's brother a few weeks before then. The women had expressed that if Cornet had moved so much as an eye muscle in a way of an escape, that they would kill him on the spot. The women kept a good guard on the man, and he was safe until the morning. They moved on to Boonesville, where they caught up to the 14th and Colonel Lilly, where Jones handed over Cornet, his prisoner. 
The men lifted up Jones on their shoulders and carried him all over the camp for bringing in Cornet safely. This is a yarn that Clabe Jones spins in his autobiography about how his men were able to capture, bury, and resurrect Confederate General Applejack Barrel and turn him into a general for the Union that helped to inspire the troops. Colonel Lilly ordered Jones with a posse of men to Letcher County, Kentucky. It took them two days to reach Whitesburg. Once they reached Sandlick, they were beset upon by rebels who retreated towards Virginia after the first few volleys. Running after their quarry, they spotted a wagon crossing a point above town and seized the wagon from the rebels that was full of dried apples and applejack. They filled their canteens full of the tasty brandy and toasted to their new capture, Confederate General Applejack Barrel. They decided to bury the general beside the road, and the spirits that they had partaken of moved John Smith of their party to conduct a moving funeral of Confederate General Applejack Barrel. They emptied the wagon of all the apples and filled it with fence posts and burned it. Later, they captured Mr. Sturdivant that told them that the rebels would return. Jones then stationed his men at the gap below the mill dam and waited for them to return. They waited until the rebels had passed by them before they opened fire. They chased them back across the Virginia line. After the rebels had been dispatched once and for all, Jones and his men went back to the grave of Confederate General Applejack Barrel. And miraculously, he was resurrected and convinced of the error of his ways. He was then persuaded to serve as a Union general and brought back to camp. Whereupon, he was able to inspire the troops to stay for a couple of days of merriment. Mr. Sturdivant became known as Jones Pet Rebel, and they played poker with the men and won all of the money in the camp and courted lots of ladies from the area. After this, Mr. Sturdivant swore not to pick up any arms against the Union soldiers and was allowed to return home. The rebel camp was pretty disheartened at the thought of losing the general in such an undignified manner and to learn that he had turned coat and now ran with the Union Army. As soon as Colonel Cottle had learned that Jones had whipped the men who guarded the general, he took his men and faded into the woods of eastern Kentucky. Miles Webb Miles Webb was the brother-in-law to Jones. He was captured with Mr. Williams by Jones and his men. Jones and his men and the two prisoners stayed with a man named Cottle. During that time, they had some girls make everyone some supper. While they were eating, rebels had surrounded Jones and his men. Shots were fired from both sides and Jones and the men were able to escape except for his brother-in-law, Miles Webb. He had died while trying to escape. The rebels then retreated back to Whitesburg. First Rounds of Raids Jones learned that Captain Hayes was at the mouth of Lots Creek below Hazard, Kentucky. Colonel Lilly ordered Captain Strong to take a company of men to break up the rebels' camp. While the rebel camp was cooking breakfast, the company, along with Jones, surrounded the camp and drove the rebels out of their camp. In the capture, there were several guns, ammunition, coffee, several jugs of moonshine, and the Union men also ate the breakfast that the rebels had been making that morning. After breakfast, they set out for Letcher County. On the way, they ran into Captain Cook's company on Car Fork. Like Captain Hayes' men, they also fled for the woods. In the fight, Jones shot and killed Lieutenant Mays. Continuing their journey to Letcher County, they ran into another group of rebels that was headed by Captain League Hicks. Running out of the house and behind a tree stump, Captain Hicks surrendered to the Union group of men. Jones made sure of the safety of Hicks as he stayed at his house many years before when he was wounded. When Captain Strong, Jones, and all of the men reached Whitesburg, the rebels had gone back to Virginia. On this particular raid, they had killed or captured 13 rebel men without losing a single Union soldier. 
The company then returned to Boonesville. Second Round of Raids Jones was again told to gather a posse and head to Letcher County for raids by Colonel Lilly. When the group got to Whitesburg the second time, there was not any rebel camps on the way. However, the men did capture two rebel deserters. While buying cucumbers from a lady on Mason's Creek, gunshots rang through the air and Jones found two prisoners that were shot to death by a man named Calhoun. The posse left the area and went back to Boonesville. From Boonesville, they were headed to Camp Nelson. On the way, Calhoun fell out with Leslie Johnson and killed him over a dispute over the two prisoners that Calhoun had shot and killed previously. Calhoun fled to Ohio. The Round Bottom Camp Captain Foster with his men were at Round Bottom robbing and stealing what they could from the area. Jones took Captain Strong's men and marched on their camp. They took a rebel spy who told them that the men would return to the camp. They waited in hiding until the group of men passed them and then opened fire. Ten men were killed in a skirmish and seventeen were captured. Again, no member of the Union side was lost in the fray. The Last Battle While Jones was at Camp Nelson, he learned that General John H. Morgan was in the area. Before Jones and his men could engage Morgan and his infamous raiders, they had crossed into the Ohio. However, his company was sent to engage Colonel Clay instead. At the mouth of Punching Creek on Licking River, the two sides met. Colonel Clay was killed and his men broke up in confusion. The 14th was then called back to Fort Nelson and they were mustered out of service for the Civil War had now ended with the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox, Virginia. So ends this section of the tale that Jones has given us about his time in the Civil War. Unlike most war stories told by brave soldiers, we rarely have them written down for history. While this is a summary of the autobiography written by Clabe Jones, it has really been fun and interesting to see his name written in the annuals of those that had served. In our next section, we will continue with the life of Clabe Jones and his time as a feudist in the Appalachian Mountains. The Civil War might have ended, but the private wars that Jones would be involved in has only just begun. Special Thank Yous we wish to once again thank those who helped us to gather information about the people in this series. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living could not do the amount of research and storytelling that we do without the help of some great historians and friends. We have a special list today of people that we wish to thank. A special thank you goes out to Anthony Blair and Vicki McPeaks Tackett. Another very special thank you goes to Charlotte Hicks Cottle for your help about the Jones family. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Outlaws. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification button. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.